you time. Um, we've got the soup and salad luncheon next Sunday after church, and the dancers are going to be here again. Um, we've also got the Lenten Bible study coming up. That's the Wednesdays in March and a few in April. Um, we also have a guest harpist with us today named Stephen Haluska. So we welcome him and thank you for coming to play with us, for us. Um, so, and we do have one minute person and that's Les Darvis. Good morning. The second Sunday of February is traditionally known as Boy Scout Sunday. I'm pleased we have one member of my Boy Scout troop here with us this morning. You can ask him to stand up. Sorry, he's one of our Eagle Scouts. He's one of our Eagle Scouts? <laughs> this is Gabriel Ortiz, Gabriel Ortiz runs track at the Lutheran West High School, and he told us last Tuesday at troop meeting, he just broke another school record running track. In 1960, I was approached by two members of this church and asked if I would consider being the, becoming the leader of the Sea Scouts that this church sponsored. I wanted to learn more about this church before I accepted that job. So I came to church one Sunday. I was overwhelmed when I walked into the sanctuary and was greeted by four or five men. I heard a good sermon by Pastor Jump. The choir sounded great. But what really encouraged me to take the job as seen as a uh, skipper of the Sea Scout unit was the brunette in the choir. Two years later, she and I married. But while I was a Sea Scout leader, one day I got a call at work from the Boy Scout office. It seems that a boy and his father had come to a Sea Scout meeting, and both of them wanted to join the Sea Scouts. I gave each of them an application, collected their money, and sent them on their way. Suddenly, I got a call from the Boy Scout office asking me what I knew about the father. For in checking the background of the father's name, some suspicious things arose. It was at that time that I realized that the Boy Scouts of America was doing background checks on new leaderships that came along, new adult leadership. The boy and his father never came to another Sea Scout meeting, and I never tried to find out why. The Boy Scouts of America nowadays is in a delicate situation that may concern the entire program and whether or not it will survive. For you see, throughout the years, immoral leadership, adult leadership, has gotten into the Boy Scout program. As much as the Boy Scouts of America has done to try to eliminate this, it has happened. And many people in recent years have sued the Boy Scouts of America for mishaps that have happened in the experiences of boys in the past. And in suing the Boy Scouts of America today, the Boy Scouts are in dire financial straits. Some new rules have come up in, my, in the Boy Scout program that affect me. One of the rules is, and this will surprise you, that in the Boy Scouts of America, when we go to summer camp, and two boys share a tent, when we go to summer camp, it is no longer allowed for a Boy Scout to share, to share a tent with his father, even though the father is the boy's father, even though the adult is the boy's father. Because things have happened throughout the National Boy Scout program where the father, where the man really was not the father of the boy, and to eliminate this situation, a new rule has gone into effect where a boy can no longer share a tent with his father. One case that happened 
somewhere in the nation was that a father claimed to be, a man claimed to be the father of a boy and the man was not even married to the boy's mother. So to eliminate this situation, this new rule has gone into effect. Another rule that's gone into effect is when we go to summer camp and two boys share a tent, both boys must be within the, the, the two years of age of each other. In other words, I cannot assign a 17-year-old Boy Scout to share a tent with an 11-year-old boy. These rules have been set up to design, uh, to try to eliminate the situation where young boys and the Boy Scouts encounter immoral situations and it's happening all the time. When a person wants to become a Boy Scout leader, he must undergo a background check now. Last year, I was part of every Boy Scout leader and registered Boy Scouter in the country in, request, in permitting a background check of myself. This has never happened before, and I'm not worried about it. I mean, but nobody is not allowed now to be a Boy Scout, member of the Boy Scouts as an adult without going through a background check. Last weekend, our Boy Scout troop went to a Klondike Derby at the Boy Scout camp of Akron, Ohio. And I had the chance to talk to other leaders about how they feel about a recent increase in the registration fee of, boys, of, the, of a Boy Scout for annual member in the Boy Scouts of America. For the last several years, to be a Boy Scout, a boy was charged $33 for the year. It amounted to $2.75 a month. That fee decreased throughout the year when a boy joined the Boy Scouts. Late last year, the Boy Scouts of America announced a new fee beginning January 1st of this year, that for a boy to be a Boy Scout for a year, the cost now is $60 a year. $60 to be a Boy Scout. We are quite upset about this as leaders because we have to go out and try to gain membership in our Boy Scout troops by telling the parents of a potential member that it costs $60 a year to be a Boy Scout. But I'm fortunate because I have a Boy Scout troop in a church that is very supportive of the Boy Scout program here. And I've already made this announcement to the families of our Boy Scouts here in our, in our church. Later on this year, when I start collecting $60 from each member to be a member of Boy Scout during 2021, we have a new rule that I just established in our Boy Scout troop. It concerns the family, the, 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 Boy, the annual Boy Scout breakfast, which is supported beautifully by our congregation. We are going to share with every member of our Boy Scout troop some of the profits of the bank of the pancake breakfast this year and kick in a third of this $60 Boy Scout fee for every member of our Boy Scout troop so that our dues and our Boy Scout troop for the year will not be $60, but will be $40. This has been accepted gratefully by the, the parents of our Boy Scout troop here in this church. And it all depends on you folks. It all depends on you and the grateful success that our Boy Scout Pancake Breakfast has every year. So we're looking forward to having another successful Pancake Breakfast here on March the 22nd. I know many of you will come and support it, and I want you to know that in doing it, you will be supporting every member of our Boy Scout troop and helping them be a Boy Scout for another year. So thank you very much in advance. I want to introduce another member, member of the person, a person who has been a, a very successful member of the Boy Scout program through the years, and that is Pastor Diane Koval. <laughs> When Pastor came here, she told me that as a teenager, she was a member of a Boy Scout Explorer post. One day, 
uh, an amusing thing happened in our Boy Scout troop when we were practicing knots, and the boys were learning some of their knots, and Pastor Diane showed up to visit the Boy Scout troop, and she picked up a piece of rope, and she surprised all the Boy Scouts by tying a bow around her around her waist. She remembered how to tie the knots. So it's a pleasure to have a pastor in this church who is supportive of the Boy Scout program, as we have always had. We've always had a pastor who supported our Boy Scout program here, and it's always been a success. We may not have as many boys in our troop as we used to have, but as I spoke to people at this Klondike Derby who were Boy Scout leaders last year, or last weekend, about the increase in the Boy Scout fee, several of them mentioned that they feel it's the beginning of the end of the whole Boy Scouts of America in our nation, raising the fee that high. Well, anyway, may I introduce Pastor Koval, a member of the Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> I was also a Girl Scout and was a, got my silver award. I didn't make it all the way to gold. But I do just want to recognize the impact that scouting's had. And if you were ever a part of a scout troop, if you would just raise your hand. Yeah, look at that. I'm, that's a huge percentage of our, of our church. So thank you for your help with our scout troop that we have here and for the impact that the scouting has had on all of us. Thank you, Les, for leading our troop for so many years. Thank you.
Will you please join me in the call to worship? Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear God, who greatly delight in God's commandments. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. Help us, O oh God, to learn your ways, that we may light your path for others. Will you please stand and join us in our opening hymn, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing? And you can find that on page 57 in your hymnal or on the screens. Luminous God, we give thanks for this epiphany season of light. When fear casts shadows in our lives, open our hearts to your radiance. Shine on us, shine in us, and shine through us. Make us beams of justice, mercy, and love, that we may brighten your world. Amen. Let us now share signs of God's peace and reconciliation with one another.
Good. So I got two things here. A white powdery substance, not what you think it might could be. <laughs> two bags, and one of these you need to survive, and the other one you don't. One is sugar, and one is salt. Which one do you think you need to survive? Can you live without sugar? That's right. <laughs> I know, a lot of us can't live without sugar. <laughs> I'm one of those. But when you look at them, they don't really look that different, do they? You see a bunch of difference between those things? In fact, there's really only one way to tell which one's sugar and which one's salt. Really easy, what would be? To taste it, that's right. I'm not gonna make you guys do that today. <laughs> and Jesus today is talking to us about salt and about light. I'm gonna put this down. So we can't live without salt it would be pretty hard to live without light, too, wouldn't it? In my, one of my previous classes, I took a class in geology. I want to show you guys some of these rocks that I have. And one of these is salt. Did you know that salt looked like one of those things when it... Came out. Do you know where we get salt here, around here? Do you know there's a big tunnel under Lake Erie where there are salt mines? You knew about that? That's so cool. That's where we get our salt. And when it comes out, it looks like, what do you think? Does it look like this one? That looks kind of dirty, huh? Does it look like this one? The only, only way to tell? Does it look like this one? There's an easy way to tell. What do you think it is, Evan? This one tastes like salt. <laughs> it's the only way to tell. It tastes like salt. <laughs> so when Jesus tells us where to be salt and light, can I have that one back? Thank you. Then what Jesus means is we're something that's so important to our lives that we can't live without it. And it doesn't have to look very special. It doesn't have to be the prettiest rock. This is a piece of calcite. It's kind of cool. Huh? But what we are to be is something that's so essential for one another that we can't live without it, just like we can't live without Jesus. So you guys need to go out and be salt and light for the world. You guys think you could do that? They were. Can you pull them up? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get together and pray that we can be good salt and good light for the world. Dear God, help us to be that salt, be that part of one another's lives that we can't do without so that we can show the world that we can't do without you and help us to light the world for one another. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, guys.
Our first scripture today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. Shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me, and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see him? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike the wicked first fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I chose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in a sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is it not this fast that I choose to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually continually, and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit for the reading of the gospel. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for all God's people. May God add God's blessing to God's word.
please be with me in prayer? God, help us to hear your word today and what you have to say to us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Salt and light are two elements I think we're familiar with as possibly as those readers who first heard that passage from Matthew. Two elements we might take for granted and not really think much about. Salt, it comes in a blue cylindrical container. I actually brought mine from home that I think is probably about 30 years old. (laughs) Don't put too much on your food, right? It makes you thirsty, but nothing goes better with buttered popcorn or a hot pretzel. Light for us is as easy as flicking a switch. Easy to do in almost every room in our homes. And if you're like me and you have kids, you go around before you leave the house and you turn off about 20 of those light switches before you can go out the door. Now I have to admit this passage from Matthew is just a little bit too familiar for me this week. I had trouble getting into it. It's kind of almost like the Beatitudes. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. But if we look at it, and we look at especially this passage in Matthew, where else does Jesus tell his followers that they are salt and that they are light? And they're nowhere, it's nowhere else in our Gospels. Now Jesus talks about salt and about salt losing its saltiness and speaks about light and specifically about the light of the world in John's Gospel, but there it's Jesus that's that light. But here Matthew says that Jesus said that we are that salt and we are that light. So how can we be salt and how can we be light and what does it mean for us to be salt and light? For the world. Now salt and light might be almost too ubiquitous, too much around for us today to to think about, but in, in Jesus' time these were both very precious commodities. Salt was har- harvested in the Middle East, Middle East by pouring seawater into pits and then just waiting for it to evaporate, leaving the salt behind. And light, of course, other than the ambient light of the sun, was available through only wood fires or candles made from animal fat. But both salt and light, then as now, are necessary for life. You are the salt of the earth. You might have used that expression yourself when you say that someone's just a salt of the earth kind of person, one of those people that you just... No is a good person inside and out. Someone who's simple in their needs and their desires, who doesn't try to be someone that they're not. Not this complicated mixture of spices, but a simple dash of flavor. Many of you are people like that for me. Steadfast and people that you can count on. The salt of the earth. But then Jesus warns the disciples and us, if salt loses its saltiness, you can't get that saltiness back. Now I showed the children this morning some of the minerals from a collection I made back when I was studying geology, and that piece of rock salt, that piece of halite, is over, probably coming on 30 years old. It still tastes like salt. It's not any less salty than it used to be. Yeah, you can taste it afterward if you want. You can come up, Ori, <laughs> and have a taste. Salt is a basic mineral building block. It's just two atoms. It's sodium and chlorine that are arranging themselves in a, in a cubic crystal. And it's nearly impossible for salt to change into anything else. Salt is much simpler than sugar, even though they look very alike, but sugar is this complex mixture of hydrogen and carbon and oxygen. And salt is very resistant to change. Has anyone ever tried to burn salt? Even maybe by accident? (laughs) 
Now, if you put some sugar in a pan all by itself and you turn that burner on high, then you get this <laughs> mixture that is kind of gross. It's caramel, it's sticky, it's, it's really hard to get rid of. But if you throw some salt in a pan and turn the burner on high and then turn it off, you still got salt. It doesn't change. Nothing happens. So that idea that salt can lose its saltiness is actually kind of absurd. Of all the foods and all the flavorings that might have been used in Jesus' day, salt is one of the least likely to change flavor over time. And maybe that's the point one of the points that Jesus was trying to make, salt is always salt. And light is always light. And we, as Jesus' disciples, are the salt and the light. We're to be salt and light for the world. That is our calling and that is our gift. We're called to season the world and then we're called to light the world. I was kind of amazed this morning when I was driving in that the sun was actually out. Did anybody see it? <laughs> believe it or not here in Ohio sunlight in February is not something we can take for granted and I keep waiting for those days and I wake up some mornings and I'm like oh here we go again another gray day snow flurries never a big storm gray sky gray snow gray roads gray trees since I usually run outside in the morning before I take Estelle to school, I run in the dark from November until the late April. Gabriel might be able to identify with this. You might run in the afternoon, though, instead of in the morning. <laughs> Running in the dark is not much fun. But we're called to be light for the world. We're called to bring light to where we are, even here in Northeast Ohio. So how can we do that? The 17th century theologian George Fox was the founder of the Quaker movement, and he was convinced that the spirit of Christ dwelt in everyone. He was so convinced that he was willing to be imprisoned for his beliefs. Early in Fox's ministry, he had this vision in which he was told that God, who made the world, did not dwell in temples made with human hands, but in people's hearts. And for Fox, that vision became a calling, a calling to spend time in silent prayer and contemplation, to reach that inner light dwelling inside, and a calling to spend his life looking for that light in each person that he met. God dwelling in each of us, God's light, God's spark in our hearts is something that we can't lose. It's something that can't be taken from us. And our calling is to bring that light to the world and to be that light for others. So how have you been salt and light lately? And how have you seen God's salt and God's light at work in the world? When have you noticed that God is working through you to help others? When have you noticed God's light shining out of someone that you meet? Maybe unexpectedly, you just see God in that person. In one of the meetings I was in this week, someone mentioned that it's the very young and the very old who tend to just tell us the truth and not worry about pretense. They don't feel constrained to be sure they're viewed in a certain way by the world. It's pretty easy to see light, God's light, in the very young and the very old. But I don't think people have stopped sharing this salt and light. And I wonder if sometimes we just become more reluctant or more inhibited. We're called to be bold. We know that Jesus has, has given us this mandate that we are to be salt and we are to be light for the world. And I can see God's light in you today. I see God's light as in the way that you welcome one another as, as we come into this sanctuary together. As we take care of this church 
and to do the hard work of keeping the building running and asking the difficult question of what it means to be disciples of Jesus now in the 21st century here on Cleveland's west side. The prophet Isaiah tells us what it takes to be the light and the salt. Jill read for us today that when we loose the bonds of injustice, when we undo the thongs of the yoke, when we let the oppressed go free, God's light in us will shine forth like the dawn. When we share our bread with the hungry, when we bring the homeless poor into our homes, when we cover the naked, we are showing forth God's light. It's not always easy to see. Sometimes when the days are gray like they have been, we wonder if we really have God's light in us or if we can really see it in others. But Jesus has promised us and claimed us as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So I challenge you this week, I challenge you to look for ways to shine God's light into these cold and gray days. Find a way to bring a smile to someone's face. Find a way to lighten someone else's load or to feel your own load lightened by the knowledge that you do not carry it alone. It doesn't take that much. We don't need to look far to see places where God's light and God's salt are needed. Maybe a little salt will melt the icy confines of a heart that's been closed off by grief. Maybe a little light will shine at a dark corner of a soul who needs to know God's love. We are the salt and we are the light. No one can take God's gifts from us. They're our gifts forever. And they're given to us for one reason, and that is to share them with others. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, hymn of Reflection, Freely, Freely. You can find that on page 389 of your hymnal or up on the screen.
Like a spring whose waters never fail, God calls us to share what we have received. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Will the ushers please come forward?
Gracious God, through these gifts given freely, may the hungry be fed, the homeless receive shelter, and the mistreated be set free. We offer all we have and all we are, that your light might break forth in us. Amen. As we look through our joys and concerns for the week, a couple of concerns. Um, Barb Emery is still in the hospital, hoping to be released today or tomorrow. And please keep Jim Toback in your prayers, who's Ruth Thompson's son-in-law. He's not doing real well at this time. If you could please keep him in prayer. Denise asks for prayers. Please pray for our youth, the scouts and leaders, and pray for world peace. Marie says that she'd pray that Karen can breathe better and totally quit smoking. And prays that Phil can get better and come back to church next week. She also prays that she cuts back on the lottery and that she only spends money on what she needs. I think that's a prayer for all of us, that we only spend money on what we need. Please continue praying for James. Thank you, everyone. God bless and amen. Please continue praying for Pete, Denise, and family. Thank you, everyone. God bless and amen. Please pray for Alvina, a safe and wonderful return for work this week. Thank you. God bless and amen. Peggy asks for prayers for her son-in-law, Steve, for a speedy recovery. Ori asks for prayers for Dorothy, who's been struggling We have a request for prayers for all of my friends at the village and for my sister Sandy and Rosie, Bill, and Beth. God knows their needs. And God does indeed know all of our needs. And so we come before God in prayer as one people gather together. I'll lift up a series of petitions and end each with God in our light. If we could all respond together, hear our prayer. Almighty God, through the testimony of those who know your love, you have guided us to ask for what we need. Our Lord Jesus called his disciples to live as a city on a hill and a lamp on a stand, that all may see the glory of God. We pray today for the church, the community of disciples, Grant that we who claim the name of Christ may shine as light into our dark world. God of light, hear our prayer. Our brother Paul led the church not by lofty words of human wisdom, but by wisdom born of your spirit. We pray today for those who serve the church. Let our pastors and teachers and volunteers and all those who minister in the name of Christ forsake worldly knowledge that perishes and be led by your truth. God of light, hear our prayer. The scriptures say that blessed are those who honor your commandments, O Lord. We pray for our world, for the governments and for its leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion and serve the common good that the people may flourish. God of light, hear our prayer. You teach us to offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, and those who are oppressed. Let we, your church, minister to those in distress and bear witness to your abiding compassion for all who suffer. God of light, hear our prayer. To you, O God of light, we pray through Christ, 
with Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. And we continue our prayers as Jesus taught together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of discipleship today is Guide My Feet. It can be found in the Faith We Sing hymnal on page 2208 or up on the screen. Let's stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May Christ, the true light, shine upon you that you may walk in righteousness all your days. Go out to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. You are sent in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 